Well, uh, I asked the bosses around here if we could leave up the uh, if the, we could leave up the safari set for a couple of weeks, and uh, really it's because the message that uh, that I would like to bring is going to come in two parts. But uh, Bruce, if you want to go ahead and put that first slide up there, it's called "It Takes a Tribe." And uh, this week we're going to talk about how it takes a tribe to thrive. And you guys have been a, an incredible illustration of this message this week. And then next week we're going to talk about how it takes a tribe to survive. So this week we'll be thriving and next week we'll be surviving. But uh, uh, we'll reference it in front of this magnificent set that all you guys put up. And we'll just leave it there. You know, I got to thinking, if we were to take that down, it would feel like kind of taking, like taking the Christmas tree down, wouldn't it? <laughs> Don't you hate having to take the Christmas tree down? Well, we may just like leave this deal here. And, uh, but we will for a couple of weeks. The boss has said it's okay. So we'll, we'll try to do that. We're going to talk about... Uh, our tribes, and, and most of us are part of many tribes. If you'll go to that next slide, Bruce. I've been with my tribe this week, my other tribe. This is the tribe of men and women that I get to work alongside, get to work with, get to be a part of. This is my tribe in Texas Baptist Student Ministry. And we were together all week long at Dallas Baptist University in Dallas this week. Once a year, we get all of us together together. And it's about 160 people strong there. I remember uh, years ago, even just 10 years ago, when we took this picture, it wasn't just little faces. It was, you know, it was the group was smaller. And so it, was, it looked a little bit more comfortable than, than it does now. But thank the good Lord, the tribe has grown. And so this was the tribe that I was with this week. And just think about what it would feel like. See if what it would feel like to be me. 11 years ago, I was invited to be called the Evangelism strategist, the evangelism consultant for Texas BSM. Uh, uh, 1.5 million college students in Texas spread out all over the place. And, uh, you know, that, that would be really arrogant to say, yeah, sign me up for that. I'll be the guy in charge of that. No, that would be ridiculous. But I knew that I was going to be invited to be a part of an incredible team. And this is the team of men and women that I get to do this with. And they're spread out all over Texas today and uh, serving on a hundred different campuses. And because of the tribe, we see an incredible harvest that takes place every year across the state. I'm honored to be a part of that tribe. The next slide is the tribe at First Baptist Church. And uh, I only wish that I am not in that picture with you. Because if we could get somebody who knows how to Photoshop, if you would put me in there, then the picture would more accurately represent how I feel as a part of your tribe. And this week really, you know, as, as I was up there doing my other job and I was waiting and waiting to see how things were going. And on Monday night, after uh, the first pictures, Alfonso posted the first pictures, really I just thought the same thing that I was told yesterday, it was a miracle. And I was so thankful to the Lord for making you such a tribe as to be able to do that together. And uh, so, anyway, what great tribe work that uh, you were all a part of this week. And, well, I was a part of my tribe's work as well. But uh, it does. It takes a tribe, doesn't it? It takes a tribe to thrive. And any large endeavors are never done by one single individual. It's always a team effort. And, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, many hands make light work. And that it makes it work. And the many hands that went into doing this, just a great illustration. We're going to look at a story in the Bible. You can go ahead and go to the next slide if you would, Bruce. And uh, it's kind of amazing to me how things come together. Uh, it really is. And, uh, you know, like I told Mary Jane a while ago, you have no idea how appropriate what you just said is to today's message. I don't know how many of you have met, read the story of the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. And, you know, the nation of Israel had its ups and downs, and the wall kind of reflected that. It was a metaphor of the ups and downs of the nation of Israel. And uh, 440 B.C., the wall around Jerusalem was in ruins. They had been uh, torn down by other people. The gates made out of wood were all burned, and it was just the biggest mess you ever saw, the biggest mess you ever thought of. Now, get a picture of this wall, though. When it's up and going, it's two and a half miles around 
And, uh, you know, I was thinking about that this morning while I was driving down Highway 90. Let's see. If I were to drive by that wall and it were in a straight line, it'd take me two and a half minutes to drive that wall. Big old wall. Long thing. It was eight feet wide and 40 feet tall. It was a huge thing. And it had been torn down. It was in rubble. And uh, we're going to look at this story about how one man got a heart for the state of disrepair of that wall. Not only because he likes walls, but because it was a symbol of the city that God inhabited. A symbol of the city of God. And a symbol of the people of God. And it broke his heart when he saw that the wall was all torn down. We're not going to read the whole story. It's, uh, it's only about a 30-minute read. You'd do well to do so. It's the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And just 13 chapters. Takes you about half an hour to read through it. And we're going to look at this portion of it, but we're going to tell the, the larger part of the story too. But it started, like, it started exactly how Mary Jane uh, said a while ago. And uh, this wasn't scripted by me. But when I said, why did you do this? She said, well, the Lord put it on my heart back in January. I thought, that's why anybody would have the nerve to schedule anything in July in Del Rio if the idea came to them in January. <laughs> and she said, God put it on my heart. And that's exactly what happened with Nehemiah. God broke his heart over the state of the wall and what it represented. And he agonized over that, as did she. Probably kind of argued with God a little bit. No, you've got to be kidding. No, did you, have you noticed the thing's two and a half miles wide, long? It's eight feet wide and 40 feet tall. And it's the biggest mess you ever saw. The gates are all burned. And God goes, yeah, I get that. And he gave him a broken heart. The broken heart came from the Lord himself. And uh, then he came to the conviction. It's the only way convictions come, is it not? Otherwise, we've run away from the stuff that we supposedly... Looks like we volunteered it. No, we'd run from them. It's out of, con out of a broken heart that comes then a conviction to act. And that's exactly what he did. He committed himself to the rebuilding of the wall. You know, think of the walls in your life. Look impossible, impossible. Then what did he do? That's all in the first chapter. The second chapter was this. He shared the vision. He onboarded other people. And I remember when the appeals began. Mary Jane would stand here. She looked so lonely and so little. Help everybody. We have a wall to build. And none of us knows how. <laughs> and it seemed like we were all just kind of watching, waiting for others. And then, one by one, folks started coming to the forefront. Because I think of the exact same thing that God did in her heart. He did in ours, did he? Put it on our heart. Okay, I can do that. I'll be a part of that. And so in the second chapter of Nehemiah, it talks about him, you know, sharing the vision and listing a team. Chapter 3, it talks about delegation. He knew that he couldn't oversee this whole gigantic project. And why would he want to anyway? He had such capable other people. And they'd all stepped up and they've already committed. And so he delegated. And the way that they split it up is uh, the people who lived close to a certain section of the wall, well, then they would be the ones that worked on that section of the wall. And then the people who lived close to the next section of the wall, they worked on that section until they went all the way around it for two and a half miles. And that's how he delegated. I asked Mary Jane yesterday if she could give me a list of the team leaders, the co-leaders, the uh, sub-generals, of the VVS project. I figured there's eight or ten. It wasn't. There's a lot of stuff here. And uh, she expresses her special thanks to all of these folks. And uh, here's the way I'm going to do it. I was going to call out your names. If there were six of you. But there were so many of you who did this. Who led the teams. The team leaders. If you are one of the team leaders for BVS this week. This is not for you to get the credit for it, but for us to be able to express our appreciation to you, would you stand right where you are right now? Stand up, team leaders. Yeah, some of them are even out of town today. Yeah. There were a bunch of y'all. 
two sheets of folks. Wait, 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 keep standing, James. So uh, not only were there the team leaders, the ones that came along and signed up and worked with the teams. And so you guys too, those of you who helped this week, God, this, it's not for us to give you credit, but for us to express our appreciation to you. Yeah, we honestly, sincerely do. Thank you for y'all. You know, I had no idea Marilyn had those moves in her. I thought Marilyn was just a piano player, but now we know she's a dancer. She's on the World Wide Web. And so it's because you guys, you became a tribe. And uh, we, we, we became a tribe for this one endeavor. But you know what? It's, it's just like every week, week in and week out. This morning, guys were running around trying to get air conditioners fixed. Other guys were out in the yard picking up trash. Others came early this morning to turn on the air conditioners. Others were getting ready, you know, the children's area. Others were leading Sunday school classes. We had men out front to welcome our guests. And it's, it's a tribal effort. Every single day, not every single week at First Baptist Church. This is the effort of a tribe because the Lord himself put it on our hearts to be a part of his tribe. It's called First Baptist Church. So that's the way the story went. But then it got to, let's go ahead and read this section, okay? And then I'll tell you how the rest of the story played out. So uh, I kind of stopped, you know, he got the conviction and committed to it. He enlisted other people. He delegated. And let's read this one section. Uh, it's, uh, then I said to them, You see the trouble we're all in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. And its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us, first person plural, let us, let our tribe, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And we'll no longer be a disgrace. See, it was really the, the Lord's honor and the honor of his chosen people that uh, it was the occasion to which they were rising. I also tell them about the gracious hand of my God, giving credit to God for the whole idea in the first place. Oh, me and what the king had said to me. See, he had to go get permission from the government. He was a governor, Nehemiah was, but he had to go get permission, the building permit, you know, if you please. And so he went, and that was a big, that was the first hurdle. He was thinking, you know, these guys like seeing us like this. How in the world, Lord, am I going to convince, you know, the, the officials to even let us start this project? They kind of like it. They like the rubble wall. And so that was the first miracle that happened, is that he got permission to even do it. And so they replied, and look out, the, the resounding response. Let us, first person plural again, let us start rebuilding. Let's get after it. And so they began this good work. And then it's in chapter 6, you have to skip down for this next statement. So the wall was finished. 52 days. So they realized that if this work had been done with the help of God. That's uh, chapter 6. I skipped chapter 4, but I want us to go back to what happened in chapter 4. You know, we already have the other steps, everything's in place, people begin to work. In chapter 4, they got halfway done. I think of this every single time I mow my yard. You know, I mow the front yard, you know, the part that my neighbors and the homeowners association scrutinize so carefully, and I get the front all done, and then we have this privacy fence gate that goes into the backyard, and I'm thinking, I'm halfway, it's kind of hot, and I'm kind of tired of messing with it all. Every single time, I'm tempted to stop halfway. Way. What is your project that you do routinely and you get to the halfway point and it's you run into a wall? These guys ran into a wall and it's from all kinds of opposition. It happened, first of all, the people, their enemies, they came and they taunted them. Like they had a pep rally against them. And they would come and curse unflattering things at them and laugh at them and say, you'll never get this done. You are crazy to even try. You know, have you seen how long this wall is? Have you seen how wide it's supposed to be? Have you seen how tall it used to be? Y'all will never, this laughed, had a big party and everything. Well, that kind of started getting to them. But then the other thing was, there was a problem, halfway mark, the rubble. There was trash everywhere. And that, you know, you're trying to carry rocks and somebody's mixing mortar and, and you're stumbling all over all this junk that's strewn all over the place and it just got harder and harder and harder. How many times have you gotten halfway through a project and it's a bigger mess now than it was when you started? 
remember one time when uh, Chris came out, he was a little bitty kid at the time, and I had decided this was a Saturday I'm going to clean out my garage because I don't keep my garage like you do, Gino. And so uh, I said, I'm going to clean up the garage. And so I dragged all that mess out into the driveway and had the biggest mess. It looked like we had a garage sale going on. And then Chris came out and said, wow, Dad, you made a big mess. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is? When we start a project, you, when you get halfway through it, you, all you've done is you just have a bigger mess. And you're thinking, it would have been better if I hadn't even started in the first place. That's exactly how these people were going. We were crazy. Look at this mess. It was better before we even started this deal. And so they hit the wall. You know, people taunting them from the outside and then them stumbling over all the clutter and all the rubble on the inside. And they were so tempted just to chunk it all. And that was kind of the story of, B of VBS, wasn't it? I remember the conversations that happened in these offices right back here about two months ago. I wonder if we ought to just cancel. Do y'all remember that? Lori does. Where are you, Lori? Ah. Remember that? Unplug. Too big a deal. No, it's still impossible. Why humiliate ourselves publicly? You know, if we take the banners down now, maybe nobody will have seen them. <laughs> Not kidding. Happened 40 feet behind me, those conversations. And so really, halfway through VBS wasn't Wednesday. It was May. Wow, we've started this deal. People are going to laugh at us. We're just going to make a mess. It's done plug. But you didn't because you're a tribe. It takes a tribe, doesn't it? You know, anything little bitty dinky, probably do it on my own. Anything... A value, better be a tribe involved. There just better be, you know. Uh. So anyway, the project went on. We can go ahead and go to the next, that next slide, okay? I've gotten so far from my notes. I need somebody to keep up with this for me. So I won't do that. But look, look who got the credit. And really, I, I just want to make a point because... I knew that when I told Mary Jane yesterday we would like to express our appreciation, she would rather just lay low. And, and it's not because she didn't think she hadn't worked, but because she knew what had really happened. So it's the one, ones up close the most who realize what really happened here. And that's why last night it was described to me as a miracle. Because everybody knew it wasn't because Mary Jane... It wasn't because of the team captains, but it was because of the Lord. Proverbs 21, 31 says that. You can get your horses ready for battle, but it's the Lord who gives the victory. And everybody, the, those who were closest to it knew that was what had happened. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I planted a seed, upon us watered the plant. It was God who made the plant grow. And she knew that. And she didn't want to dare pose as the one who we were going to give credit to for what had been done, the investment that was made in these little kids' lives this week. She knew that it was a work of God. And we all do. And that's why we can express appreciation for her because we know it's really appreciation to the Lord. Isn't that true? That's why we applaud. We're applauding Him. Thankful for her and thankful for the tribe. Tribe effort. Friend of mine and I, Dick Jaquies, this was a much smaller endeavor, but uh, it was just my first year out of college. We were working on a ranch up south of Sweetwater, southwest of Sweetwater, close to a little town, Blackwell. Some of you know where that is. Scooter knows where Blackwell is. Not many people do. And uh, we had decided that summer, this was going to be the summer that we're going to get into our routine. Every morning we're going to go for a run out there on those old hot cleachy roads. Hot even in the morning, you know how it is, and Sweetwater and San Angelo and all those, that whole country, hot, even early. But we started and we, we had set a goal. We wanted to run five miles, uh, but we set a date. And the crazy thing, we set the date, the deadline for us to achieve this deal in August. That was ridiculous. Well, I never lived in West Texas. 
you know, I grew up behind a pine curtain. And uh, I didn't know how hot it was and all that sort of thing. But we set this go. We set this date. We did it together. We packed it together. Had some, we had some accountability. It was a tribe of two. And Dick and I, from Kansas, he, just, he was a student at uh, Kansas State University, Dick was then. And now he's a pastor of a church in Oklahoma City. But uh, the date started coming up close. For We've been working our way up, trying to meet this goal. Because of the accountability of each other, we kept, both kept going. We didn't stop halfway through. And so here it was, this date in August, and that day we were in San Angelo. And so we realized, and we couldn't do it early in the morning. You know, at least you can avoid some of the heat if you get started early enough. You just have to watch for the rattlesnakes in the road. But uh, here it was, this was the day that we had set. It was the day, we are going to stick to it. And uh, we were in San Angelo. The only place we knew to go run was at the Angelo State University football track, football field with the track around it. And it was when the Houston Oilers, used to be called Oilers, what are they called now? Texans? Yeah, they used to have their summer training camps at, 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 their, at, San Angelo, at Angelo State. And, uh, but uh, we got there middle of the day, like lunchtime. And so we started around the track. How many times do you have to go around the track to run five miles? Anybody know? 20 times. So away we went, started running around track, and running, 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 and it was hot. Halfway through, couldn't make this up, the sprinklers came on, <laughs> on the field. And we were running around the track, but they still sprayed out there too. And so, you know, it was really a gift from God, but we thought, how inconvenient is that? And so we just kept running through the sprinklers, and uh, then we both finished, and not a word was said, we dragged ourselves out into the middle of the field and just plopped down in the grass in the sprinklers to, trying to catch our, our breath. And I told Dick, I said, Dick, if you hadn't been here, I would have never finished. And he said, if you hadn't been here, I wouldn't have either. Synergy. What happens when you're part of a tribe? Even if it's a tribe of two. You know, we can do more together than we can ever do alone. You know, geese... You know, flying formation. You know why one side of the V is always longer than the other? Because there's more geese in that side. <laughs> but here the geese are. They're flying, you know, they go south for the winter and then back north to Canada where we used to live for, for the summer. And uh, they fly 70% further because they fly in formation. It takes a tribe. Consider draft horses. When we were in Guatemala, the people logged beautiful mahogany lumber out of those steep mountains. And, and uh, there was no tractor that could get to that. And so the way that they dragged these logs out was with teams of oxen in yoke. And I have video of it. It's incredible to watch. And so, uh, you know, a team working together like that. I don't know what the statistics are for oxen. But for horses, it's this. When you put two together, you don't get twice the ability to pull a load. Know what you get? Three times. Two can pull three times because it takes a trap. Because we can do more with one another than we could ever do on our own. Well, so this morning, we celebrate the trap. And uh, we... We, I'm, I'm counting myself among you, okay? I'm a part of your tribe. We got to see God do some good things because of the exact same thing that happened in 440 B.C. It takes a tribe. Thank you, tribe members, fellow tribe members. Thank you for letting me be on your tribe. I'm honored to serve, serve with you.